good morning and welcome to the Isle of Faces. I am Sir Buckley. You are listening to Scraps and Scrolls for a Storm of Swords Part 7. As you well know by now, this is the partner project to History of Westeros' Valoridis. And as I say, we are well into Storm of Swords now. We have another five chapters to go through with you today. I am speaking to you from a very rainy, a very windy, a very, well, I'll be frank, it, it looks bloody awful out there. Uh, England slash Isle of Faces but we're glad to have you with us either way thank you always so much for joining and downloading and sharing and all of that business not too much housekeeping before we get going today as always you can reach me on Twitter at Sir Buckley S-E-R because we're fans of George S-E-R Buckley you can send an email to Isle of Faces podcast at gmail.com you can find us on Podbean and YouTube and all the other places you would find podcasts we would love to hear from you you might have comment on our chapters we're going through today. You might want to comment on our pair picks. You might want to suggest some pair picks. You might just want to say hello. Either way, love to hear from you because that is always fun and we like getting involved with the community, of course. Last week I mentioned some announcements coming. They are still coming. I'm just going to keep those cards close to my chest until I can tell you everything. If you're really desperate to know, you can always pop over and become a patron because those fine folk, our dear green folk, they already know the score. But like I say, new stuff coming to the other faces, so just keep that eye out on the God's Eye horizon, please. So before we get to our chapters today, and they are some very important chapters, I must say, we will go through last week's pair pick. So if you remember this week, we were going for a kind of a queenie vibe. It was Val versus Marjorie, and I can tell you now, closest we've ever had, I believe, closest margin of victory goes to Val, 56% to 44 so it was very close. I would probably say that's a bit of an upset victory. Val's obviously the lesser-known character. She's introduced much later. You'll probably see her on the page a lot less, um, lesser-known within the world itself as well. So very, very interesting that people have chosen that, especially because the comments we got this week actually lean more towards Marjorie. Let me take you through a few of them now. So at... Ejel Cotton Scamp, and I'm, I'm sure I butcher that every single week, or I'm just going to keep going with it. This week's comment was, this one's hard. I'd love a free folk POV, but I would really like to hear Marjorie's thoughts on Cersei's actions in A Feast of Crows. What exactly is Marjorie scheming in both Storm of Swords and Feast of Crows related? How involved was she in the Purple Wedding? Good question. But I think mainly I want her take on Cersei, don't we all? At Manners Without, that's the Brotherhood Without Manners podcast, they said, I think this one is even harder for me to choose than Varys versus Littlefinger. But I think I'm going to say Marjorie. I would love to know what's going through her head during the trials and all of the interactions with her and Cersei or Sansa. Granted, Val would also be awesome. So another one for Marjorie there and another good point. We just want to know what's happening <laughs> with these Tyrells, really. I think that's the key to Marjorie. At Tony3483, hmm, this choice is more difficult the more I think about it. Do I factor in Osha getting a POV? It's a good question. Do we need to factor in all previous pair picks? Is George going to end up with another 10 POVs for Winds of Winter and Dream of Spring? That is a very good point. He says the main reason for voting for Osha was to get a free folk POV. So now I'm wondering if I'd prefer Osha over Val. But a Marge POV would be fascinating. Lots to think about. So yes, I think that's clear Marjorie's main, what Marjorie mainly brings is an in-look into House Tyrell. How much does Marjorie know? How much is it Elena on her own? How much is it Mace on his own? And those interactions with, with Sansa and Cersei that I mentioned, that'd be good. I'm surprised no one mentioned finding out exactly what's going on with her purity, if we want to call it that, or maybe what's going on with Loras. Maybe people have already made their minds up about that. But in, in Val's Corner, we have... At V. Dakasini, loyal friend to the other faces, loyal patron. We so much appreciate her. She wrote, I vote Val because she's my girlfriend. But really, I want to know what she knows about Grayscale, how she found Tormund, and I suspect she has a lot of intel on Winter. Marjorie would be useful to know what the Tyrells are really up to, like we've just said, even though she's not aware of all her wonderful scheming grandma is up to. But that's about it. Politics are central to A Song of Ice and Fire, but I prefer the idea we could know more about Winter with a capital W through Val whose relationship with Ghost tells me there's more about her than being a beauty. So that's wonderfully said, isn't it? That's a great call to action to get us to vote for Val there. And I had to admit, I completely forgot about her grayscale stuff. So yes, that would be very interesting. I'm very keen to know more about that. And know more about Val in general. So I think maybe that's why people have gone for this, because we want another POV in the north. That's quite a common thing we found in these pair picks. 
and we want to know what Val knows because she's obviously very resourceful, she can get things done and she has some knowledge that we just aren't privy to yet. So, can clearly, so I can clearly see why people have um, chosen Val, especially because she might have a yet closer relationship with John and he's going to come back different, isn't he? So that was this week, the closest margin of victory there. Well done, Bolly. Thank you for voting and sharing and everything like that. Let's move on to this week's pair pick. We went queens last time, so now we're going to switch it to kings, or basically kings. And I think these two are probably one of the more famously asked for POV, so it'll be interesting to see where you land. We're going to go with Rob Stark and Tywin Lannister, the two opposing forces of the original War of the Five Kings. So that is very, very interesting. That's definitely one to think about in this week's Scraps and Scrolls because we have a lot on Tywin. We have obviously had a lot of Rob in previous weeks and weeks to come as well. So let me know your thoughts on that. Please do vote, please do share, please do comment and tell us why you picked who you picked. We shall see who becomes a new POV, Tywin or Rob Stark. And I guess that works out well, quite well because they leave the narrative roughly at the same time as well. So that would be very, very interesting. Okay, that's enough housekeeping for today. Let's get to it. Let me remind you of our five chapters today. We begin with Sansa 3, then Aya 5, John 4, Jamie 4, and Tyrion 4. So as you can see there, as opposed to last week, we are almost completely in King's Landing slash the Riverlands. We're getting very uh, zoomed in here. Yes, we do have John at the ball. He's the outlier. But apart from that, we're really igniting, reigniting the, uh, the King's Landing stuff and the Brotherhood versus the Mummers and all that kind of thing. So let's kick it off, shall we? Let's go down to King's Landing for Sansa Free. Like I mentioned a little bit there, it occurs to me that the entire King's Landing area has really yet to kick off in terms of plot prior to today's episode, despite us now being about 30-odd chapters in. It hasn't quite been slacking, but other than the betrothal news that we had before for Cersei and Tyrion, it definitely is taking a slow build up to the explosive ending to come. Everything just comes in a big rush in the second half of this book. It's, very, it's going to be very hard to keep up, very exciting when we get there. Still, we do get two big chapters on the same subject today, beginning with this incredibly hard read on multiple levels for Sansa as she is again cruelly ripped from the innocence of childhood and forced to experience ordeals as an adult through a non-sensual, terribly cruel lens. Unless we forget, it's the first of our four weddings in this book, so we get the tone set that none of them are going to go well and no one's going to enjoy them whatsoever. I guess Lysa does, maybe, but only for a little bit. This chapter opens almost cruelly by returning us to Sansa's innocence as a young woman delighting in her dress and getting pampered and made her feel nice for once. She's even more comfortable in it than she was in her previous chapter when it was being made, back when we could share in her pure delight. Unfortunately, since then we've been through Tyrion free and discovered that Sansa's hopes of, of Highgarden and Willis have been dashed and she will eventually find out she's to be married to Tyrion. Let's have our first quote of the day here. You are very beautiful, my lady, the seamstress said when she was dressed. I am, aren't I, Sansa giggled, and spun, her skirt swirling around her. Oh, I am. She could not wait for Willis to see her like this. He will love me, he will, he must. He will forget Winterfell when he sees me. I'll see that he does. So uh, that's such a tough start for us. Sansa is giggling, she's spinning, just like a girl of her age should be. This is probably the happiest we've seen her since Ned's death, and it's so desperately deserved. But George denies us the chance to enjoy it because, like I said, we, we already know what's about to happen. So he's really just sticking a knife in here. He gives us this paragraph with the full knowledge that it's fake, it won't last, and we get to feel awful. So thank you, George. It's as if we want to reach through the page and warn her, but even that is a tough ask when she's finally enjoying herself. We just don't want this to end for Sansa. Making this far, far worse is the fact that Cersei is now there witnessing this joy and knowing full well she's about to smash it to pieces. It's true sociopathic behaviour from Cersei, and the fact she's probably still pissed off about her own orders to marry don't excuse her at all. As we've said with Jamie in previous chapters, there's an air of, if I have to suffer, so do you with these Lannisters, and definitely with Cersei. Maybe those should actually be the Lannister words. That might actually work better. If we had Cersei's POV here, we'd likely find a sickly smug old woman taking what joy she can in what's about to happen to Sansa. Remember, Cersei considers Tyrion the worst possible prize a girl could get, and even though Marjorie is now on the scene, Cersei spent a lot of time maybe believing Sansa was the younger, more beautiful queen come to displace her, so she likely sees this as deserved comeuppance. 
She even waits to say anything specifically until Sansa admits her own beauty to bring up the news, even if Sansa doesn't actually understand that straight away. So it's almost as if Cersei is hoping Sansa will associate the feeling of beauty with negativity and bad news from here on out. On top of that, it's not merely a case of sharing the misery in the present. Cersei was once in a similar spot, believing she was going to marry someone she wanted and get her happy dream. Instead, she got the opposite. So she had to, so does Sansa, right? That's Because that's the healthy way to think, isn't it, Cersei? As we discussed in Sansa's last chapter, this is a woman's dress on Cersei's command. Sansa notes it this time as well, though she doesn't think much of it at the time. Low bodice, tight at the waist, white, critically. In a moment, Sansa will notice the men looking at her in the same way they did when she was beaten in the yard, which you could take as a note of pity or of her dress being more revealing. And as we said last time out, there's a sense of Cersei trying to drag Sansa from childhood into adulthood again, because if she had to do that, then so does Sansa. Cersei wants someone to share her pain, perhaps to remove some of her own self-blame, should she actually possess any. She probably doesn't. Another quote. A maiden's cloak. Sansa's hand went to her throat. She would have torn the thing away if she had dared. You're prettier of your mouth closed, Sansa, Cersei told her. I'm unsure what the proper term to use is here. Gender betrayal, maybe? I don't know. Either way, it's a double down on our point. This seems the exact type of thing Cersei will have been told in her life. In fact, though in a different way, it's essentially the message Tywin sent in Tyrion's last chapter. We aren't bothered what you have to say. You are a body and nothing else. But rather than use that as a connection to Sansa, or in some mad universe, a reason to protect a young girl from the same, Cersei uses her pain as her sharpest weapon. So perhaps the white dress didn't sound the alarm, but then again, I, I don't know if white for wedding dresses is actually a thing in Westerosi culture. But a cloak with her family colours does give the game away for Sansa as she suddenly clicks what's going on and that nice happy girl we had for just a few paragraphs there is gone. And isn't it a cruel irony, a symbol of her family, something in her father's colours, as Cersei puts it, can be what actually inspires terror within her. We have another quote on Sansa's thoughts here. Dontos the fool was not so foolish after all. He had seen the truth of it. So the lines to annoy us and make us angry are really piling up in the first couple of pages. Poor Sansa is actually complimenting P Dontus's political foresight without realising it's his betrayal that has made this situation come about. Very, very annoying there. Another quote. Wolves are supposed to be brave, aren't they? Brave. Sansa took a deep breath. I am a Stark. Yes, I can be brave. So we like to compare Sansa and Aya whenever we get a chance, and that seems to be a sentence straight out of Aya's mouth there. So we move down from the, the dressing room down to the uh, sept, and the first person she comes across is none other than Joffrey. And he gives us some rather horrible gems in this chapter. Let's start with this one. I'm your father today, he announced. You're not, she flared. You'll never be. There's probably nothing more insulting you could say to Sansa than this. And it's superb to see her not back down to Joffrey in this moment. It's as if she's become too terrified to care about consequences after this news. What else could they do to her, in her mind? Even though it's a moment of emotion, it's a far cry from the Sansa who could barely open her mouth in front of Joffrey not so long ago. And speaking of renewed strength and bravery in Sansa, it's worth noting that before this, she both tries to argue against Cersei and then channels her sister again by trying to run, even though she clearly knows there's no chance of escape. We can take that as a sign of strength, but also that this news terrifies her so much that she has no other option. When Sansa and Tyrion come together for the first time in this chapter, with Tyrion kind of saving Sansa from Joffrey yet again, it is nice that Sansa notes that Tyrion has saved her before and is, all things considered, the best of the Lannisters. Tyrion does deserve that much. He did do those things after all, but it's critical for us to realise that's as far as it goes. The best Lannister, for Sansa, simply means the dullest sword on which to fall. He is still a Lannister, he is still the enemy, and he is still contributing to the Lannister-Tyrell alliance, they intends to defeat her brother and family in war. Sansa thinks on how Dontos told her they all just want her claim rather than her. We have access to Tyrion's mind and know that Tyrion does view Sansa as a human being rather than the walking key to Winterfell that everyone else does, but that doesn't mean he wasn't still tempted by the idea. It's also an endearing moment that Tyrion offers for another Lannister to be summoned in his place if she finds him unworthy. That's a tough thing for Tyrion to say given his insecurities on his looks and his general unlovableness factor in his own mind. But then again, I suppose if Sansa had taken the offer, he would have at least been able to stick it to Tywin a bit, so there is something for him there. But it's all a moot point for Sansa. That fire we saw in her a minute ago has died, because to her, Tyrion isn't offering any other option, that's the point. They are all labelled Lannister, and they are all just as horrible a choice. 
So of that, the ceremony begins and Sansa's walking up the aisle to her marriage. We have this quote. Sir Balon Swan and Sir Boris Blunt were there in Kingsguard White, but not Sir Loras. None of the Tyrells are here, she realised suddenly. The allies and friends Sansa has made so far in this book, that have finally made her dream of a life outside these walls and made her happy for the first time, are gone. And whether Sansa believes that they are being kept from her by not being informed of the wedding date, or if they stayed away out of anger or hurt, feeling, or hurt feelings, the result is the same. Sansa's first allies have gone. While the actual ceremony passes in a horrible haze for Sansa, the details still stack out to us and weigh on our heartstrings. The image of a young girl having to cry all the way through her wedding is tough enough, but combine that with a room full of people who assume they can see that she is crying and do nothing about it is even worse. We've gone right back to Sansa's old situation of being completely alone among these people, the companionship and solidarity of Marjorie and her cousins already in the rear mirror. Crying is bad enough, but then we have Joffrey molesting her on what is supposed to be the most special day on her life. It's not to be ignored that this would be bad enough if it was, say, Aya, but Sansa has been dreaming of and idealising her wedding since she was old enough to understand what it was, and that's all been stolen from her. In terms of Joffrey's despicable actions here, it's unclear whether he's being blasé enough so that everyone sees, or subtle enough to keep Sansa in a private hell of her own. Each is as bad as the other, really. If this was a room full of people willing to watch a bride cry, why wouldn't they watch her be abused as well? We have the quote here. Sansa stood stiff as a lance as his hands came over her shoulders to fumble with the clasp of her cloak. One of them brushed her breast and lingered to give it a little squeeze. Then the clasp opened and Joff swept her maiden's cloak away with a kingly flourish and a grin. Again, this ties into the idea of Sansa being dragged through a rite of passage she doesn't want to go through yet. Instead of Cersei, this time it's Joffrey, who sexualises her first with his touching and then ripping her identity as a girl and maiden by taking her cloak off. It's supposed to be a gentle, loving gesture, even if still problematic, initiated by a caring father. Instead, we get Joffrey with his evil smile, just like the one he had when he had her father killed. We've said on our recent episodes that Joffrey really hasn't been a presence so far in this book, which is ironic given one of its major events revolving around him later on. But he's come back with this sickening bang here. He's as bad as ever, maybe even getting worse. And Sansa is now marrying into his family. Like we said earlier, it's not whether Tyrion looks like the Knight of Flowers or not, it's that he has worked tirelessly to keep Joffrey on the throne and in a position to do things like this. That's the bottom line, one that Sansa understandably cannot see past. We know it's not so black and white and that Tyrion has problems of his own, but there's no escaping that bottom line. Now we go from Maiden's Cloak to Bridal Cloak, and another difficult part of this chapter, and to be fair, I think all parts of this chapter are pretty difficult, this might be the most difficult chapter to kind of analyse and talk to you guys about. It's just it's not a fun read. But either way, when Sansa refu refuses to kneel for Tyrion to put her cloak on, because we have access to both these characters' minds and we are likely quite fond of both of them by this point, we get really torn up here. Simultaneously, Sansa is being forced into the most horrible wedding imaginable, but Tyrion is also having his deepest flaw exposed and mocked in front of an assembled crowd while also dealing with his own difficult memories of marriage. Basically, neither of them can win here. Is Sansa's refusal to kneel because Tyrion is physically different to her preconceived notion of what her husband should be through no fault of his own, incredibly cruel in a vacuum? Yes, it is. We should feel bad for Tyrion here. Is it understandable, given the situation where all agency has been removed from Sansa, where her choice of future partner, her innocence and soon her own body have been stolen from her? Is it understandable that she tried arguing, then running, leaving her only this petty stubbornness as a way to rebel against this unstoppable tide. Yes, both understandable. We should feel bad for Sansa here. Neither Tyrion or Sansa are perfect in this chapter, but I would encourage us to try and look above to those holding the strings, the Tywins who have arranged all this for material gain, and the Cersei and Joffreys who take a cold delight in watching two people both equally pained and embarrassed. Either way, Sansa does feel shame for her action almost immediately, and does put on the show of kissing her husband, despite her mind and soul not being interested whatsoever. In the small hall, the Tyrells return, but only Marjorie cares to even look at Sansa. To the rest, she is now to be shunned. She is one of the other side, save for, eventually, Sir Garlan. Like we said back in Sansa 1, Garlan is one of the good guys, and he is one of the rare bright spots in this chapter. The dancing portion of the ceremony is really the only lift Sansa gets at all, while we can clearly see Tyrion's mood worsen and worsen in the background as we go. But Sansa's conversation with Garland remains my focus here. 
Much has changed since we last saw him, with him now being promoted to Lord of Brightwater Keep, a major boon for a second son. And it's always so easy to forget that he is a second son, seeing as we are yet to see Willis on page. Last time out we saw Garland being an ace with a sword, now we get to pair that with the gallant part that makes him one of my personal favourite. Here's a quote. So Garland laughed. I was a plump little boy, I fear, and we do have an uncle called Garth the Gross, so Willis stroke first, though not before threatening me with Garland the Greensick, Garland the Gauling, and Garland the Gargoyle. It was so sweet and silly that Sansa had to laugh, despite everything. Afterwards, she was absurdly grateful. Somehow, the laughter made her hopeful again, if only for a little while. That's a, a pretty major quote there. If someone can manage to get Sansa to smile, in this chapter of all chapters, they deserve our praise. Garland's story about childhood names is so self-deprecating and out of place in this world of constant, uh, cough cough, sword measuring males, it is truly endearing. We combine that with his use of dancing to distract Sansa, his making it clear that he and Leonette are concerned for Sansa's well-being, and even his attempt to make her feel better by going anti-Tyrell for a moment to make this one of the kinder moments in the entire series. Yes, he is a Tyrell, and we know that this is their mission statement and main strategy to get across to people with niceness, but I think there's a huge element of truth here too. I think Garland is being genuine in his concern. If it's useful to keep Sansa on the side for later, that's a happy byproduct. And remember, after this, uh, after this ceremony, Sansa theoretically has lost all use for the Tyrells at the moment, so Garland could have easily just stayed away and left her to her misery, but he didn't, he's a good guy. But just like that, we switch from a gallant, honestly kind person, like I say, a rarity of Westeros, to, well, his complete opposite. Yes, it's time for Act 3 of Joffrey in this chapter. Here's his quote. As they whirled to the music, Joff gave her a moist kiss. My uncle will bring you to my bed whenever I command it. Sansa shook her head. He won't. He will, or I'll have his head. That King Aegon, he had any woman he wanted, whether they were married or no. This is as if Joffrey is trying to make up for the lost time for this first third of the book. He clearly just sat there thinking up the cruelest things he could say to Sansa. And he's pretty damn good at hitting the mark. As if a forced marriage to her family's sworn enemies and her father's killers isn't enough to make Sansa feel imprisoned, Joffrey is tripling down on this idea that there is truly no escape from his evil whims. First, she thought she was saved when her betrothal was broken, but no, apparently not. Surely being married to someone else, to one of Joffrey's own relations, would keep her safe. No, not that either. Joffrey is displaying complete control and dominance, something he would undoubtedly mix with his sexual desires were he ever to summon Sansa to his chambers and is simply trying to outdo himself in terms of being disgusting. Apparently willing to open up his display of control to the entire room, Joffrey commands that the bedding ceremony take place, more than likely because he wants to do his best Ares impression and take certain liberties during the ceremony, both to humiliate and terrify Sansa, and to get a rise out of his uncle, which he certainly does, though probably not in the way we see. For all the Tyrion slash Joffrey interactions we've had throughout Clash, this is essentially the first time they've been together since the Blackwater, and therefore possibly since Joffrey ordered Tyrion murdered, but that's another discussion. It seems like all their rage at each other has built up and chosen to release now, as Tyrion, who's been drinking and sinking lower and lower in this chapter, in fact it's a great dance Tyrion impression, is pushed far enough to threaten both king and kin in the front of the assembled court. Thanks to Tyrion chapters both before and after this, we can imagine how the booze and memories of Tysha have driven Tyrion into a rage, and I'd guess a public bedding ceremony is just a little too close for comfort. There might even be a percentage of him still sober enough to realise what it would actually mean for Sansa. It's all about to get far worse and spill over between Joffrey and Tyrion before Tywin of all people steps in to keep everybody happy. I think it's this that shows best what a volatile situation this, this is both in the moment and in general. I believe it clear that if Joffrey had not died relatively soon, or perhaps even if he had not been distracted by the success of the Red Wedding, he would have started calling upon Sansa soon enough. He and Tyrion would have pushed against each other until something big happened. It's easy enough to imagine in this scenario. Tywin controls the situation with ease, but I've always dreamt of being allowed to see what would have happened had Joffrey just dug his heels in. Let's just imagine it. He's drunk, he's humiliated, he's angry. Let's just say Joffrey throws a giant tantrum, orders Tyrion killed right then and there, and Tywin orders that he is not. I would adore the ability to see how that would have worked out, who obeys who, etc, etc. Needless to say, that could have easily pipped the Red Wedding for first ceremony with a death in this book. But Tywin does prevent all that, and Tyrion takes his cue that it's time to play the part and self-deprecate himself again. Unfortunately, Sansa gets pulled into that too with, with Tyrion's graphic jokes, but at least it gets her the hell out of there. Now as we move to the chamber scene, I, I will warn you this is, a, again, a particularly difficult part of the book in many ways. 
you might not want to listen and discuss to this bit completely understandable it's not all that fun to analyze either so feel free to skip ahead here but we'll go into it now so once they are alone in their room Tyrion confirms to us that he's obviously been thinking of Tysha all day long and all the pain that comes along with those memories it's a tough read for us because we know the full stories and what horrors Tyrion means when he says House Silverfist. We know that this is a major reveal for him, one only shared with Shay and Bronn so far, and maybe even drunk Tyrion's way of trying to make a genuine emotional connection. But Sansa hasn't read Tyrion's POV chapters. She doesn't know the full story of Tysha. From Tyrion's description, it's merely a well-kept secret about a little romp in the hay from years ago. She doesn't know it's Tyrion trying to explain how much pain he's in, or he knows where she's coming from in terms of being controlled and abused by House Lannister. All she knows at this moment is that she's so terrified she wants alcohol to numb the experience for her, and she really can't be blamed for not reading Tyrion's cryptic drunken signs. So like I say, thus a difficult chapter ends with yet more difficulty as we enter a well-discussed scene that is, as I say, difficult from all angles. Chief among the issues is the bottom line that Tyrion is sexually attracted to a trembling 13-year-old girl, a fact that George makes sure is repeated and hammered in here. Sansa is a child, Tyrion is not. There's no escaping that part. Now, at the end of the day, thankfully, the marriage is not consummated, but it's very, very risky ground to assign any brownie points to Tyrion merely because he decided not to rape someone. That's not really how it works. You don't get you know, a plus, a thumbs up just for not doing the evil thing. That's supposed to be the minimum. On that note, horrible as it is to believe, I've seen people argue that this consummation would not be raped because the two have just got married. Hopefully, I don't need to point out to you how ridiculous that statement is and we can just ignore that line of thinking. The bottom line, Tyrion very nearly rapes a trembling girl and as much as that might be a result of the abuse he suffered from his own family, it remains the situation and it remains a very difficult read and a difficult bottom line. There's no ignoring it, I'm afraid. Now it's true, Tyrion does try to calm Sansa with kind words in a gentle manner but there's also an element of persuasion in those words. It becomes even more difficult because these lines are so tied into, into Tyrion's physicality and his self-worth that it's almost as if he's talking to himself. I'm sure in Tyrion's mind there is an element of there's no escape, but if I'm going to be made to do this, better to do it now. And again, we can blame Tywin for that mindset, but that doesn't help Sansa out right now. Tyrion is dead on about his physicality mattering to Sansa, I don't blame him for being hurt when she does end up rejecting him, that's a natural feeling, but I think he's missed that point again, that even if he did look like Loras, Sansa would still be trembling, and this would still be wrong. That's not the point here. Somehow, in this situation of all situations, Sansa finds the courage to ask, and if I never want you, my lord, which not only tells us of her incredible bravery, but delivers the only information that matters here. There is no consent. End of. Tyrion, in the end, does the right thing and again bear, bear in mind what I said about brownie points here and we can breathe a sigh of relief that we didn't have to read a very different ending to this chapter but that doesn't change the fact that this scene and the whole chapter in general have been an absolute horror show for Sansa of all her traumatizing chapters this one is right up there and that's saying something and again I say we direct the blame to the Cersei's and tyrants of the world that have engineered this situation in the first place but very very difficult chapter and i'll be honest with you i'm glad to see the back of it let's move on we are now going from king's landing into the riverlands for Aya five difficult as it is to mentally separate the many many chapters Aya has with the brotherhood in this first half of the book this one stands out a bit more because of its ending a return of a major character and a hint at Aya's second half plot in fact i'd argue that this return makes the rest of the chapter easier to forget certainly that appears to have been the case for me First affront to my previous assumptions is how, how far north Stony Sept is, that's the setting for this chapter. For whatever reason, I guess knowing that it was the site of the Battle of the Bells, I assumed it was much closer down to the Reach, because if I think of Robert fighting during the Rebellion, I think of the Reach. Clearly this is incorrect of me and shows how deep the fighting became in the Riverlands, and this does all hold some, some significance for Aya, visiting a place her father came to during the war. As Aya herself notes, this is the largest town she's visited since King's Landing, and the largest anything since Harrenhal. It gets forgotten, by me anyway, that we do indeed get to visit what might be the major town of the Riverlands, at least the central Riverlands, and what might have been a contender be to become a city after the destruction of the Dance of the Dragons. Fair Market is probably the main contender, but that's pretty far north from this point, and uh, this is just something I had to think about a lot while, while writing the Riverrun chapter in the, the Great Castles of Westeros. But first off, we get our latest episode of Harwin History. 
While the Battle of the Bells might seem to be unrelated here, Aya is actually getting a mini lesson in her own family history. First off, there's the more obvious, the wounding of the grandfather Aya is still trying to reach, and there is a certain irony in mentioning Hoster Tully's wounding, considering in our next Catelyn chapter, we'll find out Hoster has finally perished, so it gives a nice frame of this decades-long timeline. But also of the double marriage of her mother and her aunt, as we hear about John Arryn's heir, Dennis, also dying in the battle, pushing John into the agreement with Hoster Tully. I'm also guessing that this is George setting seeds for when John Connington is going to re-enter the narrative in A Dance with Dragons, given how much he's focused on during Harwin's retelling, and how much John himself focuses on this specific battle within his own POV. There's also a good mention of Miles Mouton, and it would definitely be expected that we find out more about his relationship with Rhaegar and King Aerys' court sometime in Winds or Dream. A central character of this chapter, and a perfect example of characters just getting lost in the shuffle of my mind, is the Mad Huntsman. If you'd asked me before, last week about the, mass, the Mad Huntsman, I wouldn't have been able to tell you much off the top of my head. Before he actually steps onto the stage, we hear about him relieving the food shortage situation and being a good caretaker of this area of the Riverlands. Obviously, this flies in the face of his name, and what we are going to find out about his methods later, but it's a strong move to introduce this side of him first. We also get a brief overview of the Huntsman's history and what has turned him to this kind of life in the same revenge vein of an 80s action hero. What we really have to think about and we'll come to find in this chapter, is that the Huntsman is a superb example of violence begetting more violence. He is a direct product of the war, of Tywin Lannister, and a big old spoke on that ever-rolling wheel. I suppose the Huntsman might even be included as a cautionary tale of what the Brotherhood will become when revenge is the sole motivating factor, and the members discover what, by any means necessary, really means. More on that a little bit later. We don't have to wait long to find out exactly what these means might be for the Huntsman as Aya enters the town and sees the crow cages. Here we have a quote. In the market square at the town's heart stood a fountain in the shape of a leaping trout, spouting water into a shallow pool. Now I mention this here because I think this may be included as symbolism that we are within the territory of House Tully here and beholden to their, their national laws or the laws of the Riverlands. But we are shown that Stony Sept isolation through war has made them uncaring for such rules. It's Stony Sept looking out for Stony Sept, and that's it, resulting in their own brand of justice and revenge. And knowing what we know of the war, can we really blame them for that justice being so violent? The feudal chain has obviously broken down from one direction, so it's certain it's going to go the other way as well. Hence, the crow cages are popular and an almost uniting force amongst the townsfolk, likely helping the huntsman with his own grasp on leadership. Another quote. A man laughed bitterly. The lions killed Sir Wilbur a year ago. His sons were all off of the young wolf getting fat in the west. You think they give a damn for the likes of us? It was the mad huntsman caught these wolves. But let's shift the focus from the town and, politi and politics to Aya herself. In pretty much every Aya chapter so far, we have talked about her having to deal with the idea that Rob might have evil men in his ranks, that a Northman once sworn to someone as noble as Eddard Stark could do bad things, and that she could be connected to one as such. Or, I suppose, given what she's seen at Harrenhal, there's the idea that there just could be more of the bad Northmen out there. But since leaving Harrenhal, it's all been theoretical, really, just stuff she's heard from Harwin or the other brothers. Now there are actual physical specimens in front of her, and there's no evading this important question about what Rob has brought to the Riverlands. Now, we actually know that these are Karstark men, and this isn't what Rob has brought, but what Rickard Karstark unleashed. We spoke a lot in the last Catelyn chapter about the waves that had spread out through the Riverlands because of Rickard's need to create chaos, here we see how hordes of small folk have suffered because of the whim of a lord being displeased with the actions of another lord who did something because of another. But it's them, it's the small folk being crushed by the game, captured perfectly. However, George is extra cruel in the specific order of releases this information. Before they are labelled as cast arcs and both we and Aya are made aware of their crimes, Aya goes face to face with the extreme physicality of the imprisonment by the huntsman. And to be fair, it's awful. It's awful in every way imaginable and it's almost impossible for Aya or the reader to not feel some deep emotion at the very descriptive passage. And I think Aziz got to my note on, on George pulling the carpet from under our feet and asking us some very tough questions about whether this kind of torture is right for horrible people or, or well, yeah, what's right and wrong here. So Aya eventually, she makes her choice and does something that really, really makes the connection between this chapter and Aya's future in the House of Black and White and her role as a giver of mercy in Feast and the Future when she gives the caged men a drink of water. Her actions perhaps spur her own band of brothers into action as Lem and Angai argue for the giving of mercy and the latter doing something about it. 
the comparison between current and later Aya, the amount of foreshadowing here is quite amazing. She even thinks Valam or Ghoulis as they die. Although the argument here is with a townsman rather than a specific member of the Brotherhood, at least I think that's the case, it's clear that many of them have different ideas about how things should be run, these different pockets of the Brotherhood without banners. It makes sense given the high emotions involved, the band-like nature, like I, like I say, they go in little groups, the many different leaders, the limited communications, but it gets me wondering about the ever-coming arrival of Lady Stoneheart and her flipping the table, just changing everything. What happens to all the separate bands we've come across? Are they still all a part of it by the end of the feast? Have some of them split away? As far as I remember, we certainly don't find out about the Huntsman and his crew, and that's all before we add the hopeful inclusion of Brynden Tully into the mix, but we'd best not go down that rabbit hole or I just won't stop. Given the incredibly heavy introduction to this chapter, we can forgive the Brotherhood for seeking some downtime at the Peach, which among all these terrible things that Aya has seen, might be the best reminder she is still a preteen girl, very naive in the way of the world, and a highborn girl at that, so even less aware what might, of what might go on in certain establishments, or more so unaware of the specific details. Aya is smart enough to use her observational skills to seduce the Peach as indeed a brothel, she's just not 100% on what that actually means. After spending some relative time on the sidelines in recent chapters, Gendry now makes a reappearance into the focus, as he begins blushing left, right and centre, reminding us that though he is much older and more developed than Aya, he's still a young guy with more experience at a forge than talking to women. We do get this interesting quote. The girl did have hair like the old king's, Aya thought. A great thick mop of it, as black as coal. That doesn't mean anything though. Gendry has the same kind of hair too. Lots of people have black hair. So I think this is George really daring us to blink as he has Aya pointing out that Bella surely can't be a Baratheon because she has the same hair as Gendry. It's as big of a lol moment as we're going to get to be honest. It generally has us wondering if Gendry is going to accidentally do a Cersei slash Jaime here in the peach with Bella. And from Bella we also find out it turns out that Robert always said Ned won the battle because he couldn't even hide in the proper fashion and instead spent his whole time parting with the girls of the peach. Certainly it does fit with the model of the Robert we came to know and also makes for a clear vote for the nurture argument, as Gendry is quite different from his father. Heck, he's quite different from his potential half-sister. It's a nice reminder that blood isn't everything in this world. Remember what a huge deal the black hair was back in Game of Thrones. It really isn't going to surface all that much from here on out. We'll see Gendry and Maya again in Feast, we get Edric later in this book, but so far this is the only time we get two of the King's Bastards interacting, even if it is unknowingly. Let's hope for a big family reunion in Winds. The end of this Gendry section comes with what seems to be the last gasp of the semi-romantic relationship between he and Aya, a likely casualty of the five-year gap being scrapped. As has been hinted at throughout the book, Gendry is unhappy about Aya being highborn and he being a member of the small folk. Her possession has been highlighted while they've been travelling with the Brotherhood, so he's found it more difficult to ignore, and his frustration is obvious. We have these quotes. Why did you say that? Aya hopped to her feet. You're not my brother. That's right, he said angrily. I'm too bloody lowborn to be kin to my lady high. I said go away, my lady. Combined with his embarrassment over Bella, his desire to keep Aya safe and potentially being confused about his feelings for her, he gets real grumpy. But the driver is always his class, the doors that have been shut to him because of it. He is likely aware that at some point Aya is going to be ransomed and he is not, and that will be the end of their friendship. Hence, his armour goes up. In answer to these weird questions, Aya decides to go back to something she does know. Her list, and I'm not surprised she thinks of them all being in crow cages. That's on the conscious level. The unconscious gives her a boost by sending her a wolf dream to remind her of her strength and her pack. Following that, the chapter ends with what it will be remembered for, a return. As much as the characters try to build up that it's Jamie coming to Stony Sept, we already know that Jamie is firstly miles away from this area, and secondly, we know he's already been captured by people definitely not of the Brotherhood. So while Aya tells us it's not him, Technically, the thing this chapter is most remembered for is not even explicitly said within the chapter. Instead, we are left to connect the dots of references to Cheek and Face and who could possibly turn up from Aya's list. Just to run them down, we know Cersei, Joffrey, Illyn and Meryn are all in King's Landing. But while we've heard that Gregor and assumably his men that are also on the list are hanging around Duskendale, we couldn't say 100% that they haven't been captured. But which of them, other than Gregor himself, and we're going to need a bigger cage if that's the case, would be enough to warrant such attention to Aya. That's right, Sandor could again. We can go into this further in Aya's next chapter where we really see the return of the Hound, but it's one of those things it's difficult to imagine not knowing what was, was going to happen after so many rereads. First timers might have guessed that Sandor was important to return somewhere, but we surely could not guess that he would show up here to provide the two-sided arc as a figure in both lives of the Stark sisters. 
it's going to get real interesting from here on out. Okay, so that's our Aya chapter for today. Now we're going to take our one holiday of the episode and go up north to John 4. I'm not sure if Aziz got to this note at the beginning, but I'm going to go for it anyway, otherwise the rest of it isn't going to make a lot of sense. So despite having spent so much time at the wall during Game of Thrones and seeing it in John's last chapter, this chapter is unlike any other. Despite the coolness of John going over and Sam slash Bran going under in the same book, John's climb is the far more significant. The wall is such a tentpole of the series as a whole, a pure creation of George's mind that sticks out and it's made its way into popular culture. It is truly wild to see someone, a main character no less, ascend it. It's almost like a rite of passage for John, seeing as the man named Snow is so intimately linked to a wall of ice already. That connection is only going to grow as John becomes Lorne Commander. The wall is mine is yet to come. There's the symbolism as John as the icy guard against the others as well, but to me this climbing of the wall represents John's two sides as both a Northman and now a wildling too. He will be the man to understand both sides. He will be the one to try and bring the two sides together. John will as Lord Commander, become the wall. He holds it against Mance, he opens it to the wildlings, and will surely have more yet to come against the others. He understands both of these sides because he's both been on both of them, and this chapter represents that best. Yet, for all the importance, John's actual climbing lasts barely a page, and the chapter itself focuses more on the plight of people who, for all their bravery, are one-siders when it comes down to it, not like John. In John's last chapter or two, we've spoken about how John has fallen further and further into the life of a wildling, but now, back in full view of the thing he's sworn his life to protect, John's inner night's watchman makes a noisy comeback. He firstly hoped the wildling raiders will fail. Here's the quote. The others take them all, thought John, as he watched them scramble up the steep slope of the ridge and vanish beneath the trees, and then feels his pride swelling with this quote. But in between, the only way to defeat the wall was to go over it, and many a raider had. Fewer come back, though, he thought, with a certain grim pride. As he thinks of the multiple unseen defences the Watch employs for when wildlings do get past the wall, which actually hasn't been overly discussed so far in the series, despite Eddard Stark playing a part of it in our very first chapter, he joins us in musing whether the Jarl slash Sturr conflict will continue on the other side. As we readers know, it's not a question that John will have to ponder for long. Whilst John is watching the proceedings and hoping that the first group are caught by patrol, he comes face to face with the real problem of his spying. He can't be both. If a patrol does come along when John starts to ascend, or maybe even before, he almost certainly dies along with Egret. If no patrols come, the majority of them make it over, and John has just helped a horde of wildlings get into the realm he's supposed to be protecting, along with a whole new set of problems to deal with now they're on the other side. So really, the only thing John could ever hope for is that a patrol magically appeared as they're on the top of the wall, but even then, he probably still dies. So there's just no happy ending at all here. John continues his Stir vs Yar mindset by looking at the difference in their men. His observational skills tell us of Fens who clearly thought they would never ever see the wall, and the idea of there being another side is nearly reality altering, and we'll see some of this with Gilly in future chapters. While John's first sight of the wall stole his own breath away, he was likely much more mentally prepared than any of these Fens are. As John notes, it's the end of their world. On the opposite, to Yar's men the wall is old news something they've done a hundred times before and have a hundred different te techniques to deal with. The fact that these happen to fail on this occasion speaks to the ultimate power and coldness haha, of the wall. It is uncaring, it can defeat you at any time, and it is never easy to pass. On top of this, it's a reminder that like the Brotherhood in our last chapter, but on a much larger scale, the Wildlings are not one bland force, but a mix of people with different experiences, skills, and worldviews, something that John will have to deal with in his time as Lawn Commander. Indeed, even their motivations differ. As John will note in a second, Mance has promised some hard payment in, in hard steel, or appealed to eternal glory through song to Jarl's climbers. The Fens still worship their Magnar as the god. Egret still believes in Mance's main mission. It's all a big mix, just as anywhere else in the world. The level of explanation of technique, equipment and physical description of the face of the wall is frankly insane. The amount of thinking going into this description is amazing, especially where George lays out all the multiple ways it can easily kill you. We even get a fake out when everything nearly goes wrong, but that's all just a pump fake before George actually takes his shot. Instead of having to experience it himself just yet, John is still watching this all unfold. You would think John not being involved with the tension, but it not only gives us a better picture of what's actually happening, but keeps the wall looming as we know John will have to face it eventually, and he'll find dangers such as Lee's. Here's the quote. And when they looked up, Jarl and his team were gone. Men, rope, stakes, all gone. Nothing remained above 600 feet. 
There was a wound in the wall where the climbers had clung half a heartbeat before, the ice within as smooth and as white as polished marble and shining in the sun. Far, far below there was a faint red smear where someone had smashed against, against a frozen pinnace. The wall defends itself, thought John, as he pulled Egret back to her feet. As John says, likely still with a grim note of pride, the wall defends itself, and it certainly does. Since his introduction, we've spoken multiple times on Yarl's ability for climbing the wall, and we literally just had an incredibly detailed chapter about all his prep, his skill and experience, but all of it equaled nothing. One bad break, and not only are Yarl and his team dead, it almost looks as if they were never there. The wall just regenerates. Such is the power of the wall, dominant enough to sweep away climbers as if they were nothing more than insects. And again, this raises the tension, because John doesn't have any of the experience that Yarl had, so what are the chances that he survives? As I mentioned a minute ago, John's climb is actually very short and simple in comparison to the long, detailed account of Yarl's doomed ascension. The sheer time it takes to make it up highlights the pure physical toll. But before we can blink, John is back on top of the wall, with Egret joining him atop the world, but with a very different reaction. I almost fell, she said, with tears in her eyes. Twice, thrice. The wall was trying to shake me off. I could feel it. One of the tears broke free and trickled slowly down her cheek. Though John has just been thinking of the wall defending itself, he isn't able to understand Egret also assigning it a personality and not a nice one. As we've known almost since we've met her, Egret is fiercely proud of her people, of Mance's ideals, and the fact that the wildlings are victims of the Northmen who have been made to suffer in the aeon since. The wall is the largest symbol of this injustice, the loudest horn that declares Egret and her people as savages who don't deserve any of their own land and who are decried as essentially subhuman. So it's unsurprising she finds the actual structure to be an antagonistic force. On top of that, we will come to find that the wall does hold actual magic within, so maybe Egret is actually force sensitive or however you want to put it. This leads into one of the more confusing chapter endings or declarations we'll find. Here it is. I'm crying because we never found the Horn of Winter. We opened half a hundred graves and let all those shades loose in the world and never found the Horn of Jormon to bring this cold thing down. The Horn of Winter plot has almost been forgotten by this point already. It's a long time since John found a horn on the fist and left it to Sam, and also a long time since Corin and his band got distracted by other events when they were meant to find out more about it. The plot pretty much dies from here as well, Though Sam will mention it from time to time, the horn itself is soon going to be replaced by Dragonbinder in the Islands as the magical horn that no one is really sure of for Feast and Dance. So even on first or second or subsequent reads, it seems like we never really get a follow-up to the Egret's outburst here. The Shades part sticks out especially to me and gets me wondering about something I don't see discussed all that often. Although there's large timeline issues to consider, is it possible that Mance's early diggings or disturbings or activating of magical properties somehow propelled or advanced the return of the Others? Probably not, but if we're honest we know so little about the Others' origin and mission that we really can't eliminate it as a possibility at this point. After all, earlier in John's chapters we discovered that Mance knows an awful lot about the Others and how to fight or avoid them. Is that because he's unleashed them upon the world? And on the point of this being the last real mention we get on the Horn of Joraman, it's also the most information we ever get in reference to Mance truly going for the horn as a way to take down the wall. Obviously, Mance wasn't 100% reliant on the horn, as he had a pretty sound battle strategy that would have got them through if Stannis hadn't got involved. And bear in mind, if Mance really does know a lot about the others, he might know that the wall can magically stop them, so having the wall brought down would be his last option in that case. So, did he want the horn as backup? Was it a rallying call for certain members or tribes of the wildlings? Did he believe in it or not? We have zero idea now, but perhaps one day we shall return. Still, confusing parts aside, Jon Snow has made it back to the realms of men, and he's brought some friends. But that's all for the wall and the north today. We're going back down south, back to the Riverlands, for Jamie 4. We can look at this chapter, the one following Jamie's maiming, as a muddied, fevered gateway that the character of Jamie has to pass through in order to become new Jamie. The person we've been treated to in the first two books and his first three POV chapters here doesn't die straight away, this isn't an overnight process, but we can clearly see this is where his transformation, both physical and spiritual, really begins to kick in. Whatever we think of new Jamie, or second half Jamie, whether you want to call him redemptive or anything else, we do have to note that he is a different man after his experience and becomes much, much deeper than the old smiling Disney villain. Now surprise surprise, the bloody mummers aren't being very nice to Jamie after they cut off his hand. They're being quite the bullies, I think we'll find. Here's a quote. Then he made his eyes go dry and his heart go dead and prayed for his fever to burn away his tears. Now I know how Tyrion has felt. All those times they laughed at him. It's important that we get this early tie into Tyrion here because Jamie is going to become much closer to his brother later on in the book. 
even making the consequential decision to free him and save his life against Tywin and Cersei's wishes. Some of that closer relationship is because they're actually in the same place at the same time for once. Some of it is because Jaime can now understand a bit more of Tyrion's outlook on the world, because he also now has a physical disadvantage. Interestingly, this quote shows us the physical part isn't quite there yet, and Jaime actually feels a connection with his brother over being socially mocked about something he has no control over, and it will never change. The difference being Tyrion has experienced this since birth, whereas Jaime has been fawned over by pretty much everyone for as long as he can remember. Mockery might be too kind a way of putting it as well, because the mummers are a bit more advanced than simple name-calling. Combined with their incredibly painful way of um, treating Jamie, quote unquote, they trick him into drinking horse urine. They leave his other injuries open to infection. And cruelest of all, they tie his severed hand around his neck, obviously a massive roadblock in any kind of mental healing. It's all a huge case of kicking a dog when he's down. As if not made horribly clear before, the mothers are taking the opportunity to make a highborn lord, a golden prince who got everything they ever wanted handed to him, aware that he is nothing now, he's on the lowest rung and he holds absolutely no power over them. Physical amputation isn't enough, and the mummers want to split his soul. If I had my hand, you'd learn that soon enough, Jamie thought. And already we can see the mental effect that Jamie is having, because he's still relating to a world in which he does have his greatest weapon instead of the new reality. The other side of the emotional abuse is their treatment of Jamie and Brienne as a pair, and Brienne as an individual. Tying Jamie and Brienne together so they are face to face is obviously intended as a way to mock both of them as a couple, and poke fun at switch gender roles because that's obviously the kind of thing that's amusing to them, even if their tying together does provide some nice foreshadowing for us. On top of that, Brienne is made to become Jamie's carer, as the mummers clearly don't want to deal with actually any physical consequences of their actions, and because they are happy enough to pigeonhole a woman's role now, as well as letting Jamie's ego take yet another hit by showing that he cannot care for himself. It's another form of humiliation for Jamie also, as he cannot hide his pain or his wound from Brienne in their setup and is forced to be forever shamed. This would be true of anyone that Jamie has lashed to, but it's given another layer of Brienne, considering Jamie's issues with her being stronger and a better duelist than him in his previous chapter. Having said all that, it is clear Jamie would not have survived maybe into the end of this chapter without Brienne, not only because of the pure physical care she provides, but also in the emotional connection we can see being forged even if Jamie can't. She provides some tether to the world beyond his painful hand, some reason to still care about the, the world at large, and that's what he needs right now. Needless to say, Brienne displays a strength not only purely physical in this chapter. It's unsurprising that Jamie tries to force a fight to the death when he steals Zolo's sword. Some of it is pure frustration, boiling over to the point where he doesn't want to deal with his pain anymore. But to counteract their humiliation and reduction of his sense of self, he figures he can go out in a blaze of glory, hurriedly ending his life as a warrior, so there's no time for this new form of his to enter the narrative. If Jamie dies here, maybe taking one or two mummers with him, he'll have been a warrior from start to finish and hopefully no one would remember this reduced and feeble version. Unfortunately, that's not the reality, and Jamie has fallen so far that he's not even considered a proper threat. His memories of his skills are little more than delusion at this point. Here's a quote. Shagwell came hopping from leg to leg, dancing nimbly aside when Jamie slashed at him. Unbalanced, he staggered forward, hacking wildly at the fool, but Shagwell spun and ducked and darted until all the mummers were laughing at Jamie's futile efforts to land a blow. When he tripped over a rock and stumbled to his knees, the fool leapt in and planted a wet kiss atop his head. And I think as he's got to my note on, on that being another connection between Tyrion and Jaime. So Jaime learns he will either die looking utterly pathetic or merely earn more dismemberment and lapses back into believing he is doomed either way. Again, it's Brienne who comes to save his soul. And Jaime thinks this in response to her. They said he was cruel, treacherous, reckless, but never craven. What else can I do but die? Live, she said. Live and fight and take revenge. So Brienne is shrewd enough to know that calling him a craven is what will actually get through to him. She spent enough time alongside him to know that his skin has grown thick around being called Kingslayer or anything of that nature. But the irony is, I think Jamie misunderstands Brienne slightly here. While he's thinking of being called craven throughout his life, I think Brienne meant craven as in too afraid to live without that constant backup of his sword hand. While Jamie has been obviously arrogant his whole life, he's had the skills to back it up. It's an incredible confidence boost, a real bedrock, to spend a lifetime knowing that when it comes down to it, you can probably kill anyone before they kill you, especially in this world of Restoros. But that's gone, and Brienne is saying Jamie is too craven to live in a world without that guarantee, just as everyone else has to. And she's dead on, Jamie is too afraid to live in that world. It also shouldn't be lost in us that as Brienne is preaching about resistance and taking a lump, she's immediately set upon and gives a physical demonstration as she tries to stifle her moans, giving no satisfaction from the beatings. 
And so one of Brienne's first lessons to Jamie sinks in, and he sees his life. Live, he told himself harshly, when the mush was like to gag him. Live for Cersei, live for Tyrion, live for vengeance. A Lannister always pays his debts. As we have seen and will see countless times, when the chips are down and all seems lost, Tyrion, Cersei and Jaime all refer back to their most basic element. They are Lannisters, and Lannisters simply don't go out like this. So well done Tywin for instilling some resolve in your children, I suppose. We should also note this is extremely similar to the Stark children constantly falling back onto being a wolf when things get difficult. Thanks to Brienne, Jamie seizes his siblings, the only two things he truly loves, as reasons to keep going. That, and revenge of course. But at this point, the reason matters little, the bottom line is he's chosen to keep going. But as we said at the top of this chapter, this isn't a simple doorway for Jamie to walk through, where he is one person going in and another coming out. In the same vein, it's impossible for anyone to deal with something as severe as losing their hand in such a quick, neat manner. Thus, two paragraphs after Brienne's prompted reignition of life, Jamie falls to despair again. They had taken his hand. They had taken his sword hand, and without it he was nothing. I think this is one of the most human aspects of Jamie that we ever see, and sets the tone for him going forward. He is not a shining white knight from this ordeal onward. There is no simple road to follow. This recovery, or redemption, is a maze with lots of wrong turns and backtracking. So too for his emotional state in this chapter, and many chapters going forward. Maybe Jamie has the destination, but the road simply doesn't get to be smooth in situations such as these. While it's true that Jamie experiences another low, he finds purpose in the immediate when the mummers put Brienne in the very real danger of sexual assault. Now this is dodgy ground, because even though we're Jamie's POV here, I don't think we should be reducing Brienne's near rape as just a plot point for motivating Jamie. Obviously, even with Jamie eventually ensuring Brienne doesn't suffer, the mere threat of what the mummers is, are going to do is incredibly scary and scarring, and we should be putting focus on Brienne the person and how glad we are that it didn't go worse, even while highlighting how bad it already is. The beginning of the passage is very interesting in how Jamie and Brienne cite different ways of resisting this pain based on their past. We're going to learn a lot more about both of these in Feast, especially in Brienne's case, but rereaders can see that Brienne has had to fight men off before and has won, so she is going to bet on herself again. Jamie, the one who normally resorts to violence and death by glory thoughts first, details how he spent years going away inside instead of swinging his sword, and advocates for being passive instead. Thankfully, neither are needed at the end, but it's intriguing how these two fighters come at it from different angles. Here's a quote. She was going to get herself good and killed. He knew it. And what do I care if she does? If she hadn't been so pig-headed, I'd still have a hand. This comes immediately before Jamie starts giving advice and trying to help Brienne through the ordeal, so we can already see the duality going on in his mind. Though Jamie has argued for passivity, he ends up going the other way, actively doing something to save Brienne by shouting about sapphires. It's two big hints about Jamie going forward. He's willing to do something to help someone else, and he's used his brain instead of his sword. When Brienne comes to ask Jamie why he shouted out a bit later, he actually gives three different explanations, leading to me towards the idea that the true reason is the one he doesn't mention. He merely wanted to save someone in trouble. The chapter moves on to a new section as we approach Harrenhal and get a whole new set of Jamie information. It's probably not talked about enough how important it is that the first place Jamie goes after his maiming is somewhere of huge personal significance to him. He was named to the Kingsguard at Harrenhal, and he was named to the Kingsguard because of his now gone hand, if we ignore the whole Ares trying to stick it to Tywin thing. The metaphor is quite clear here. A bitter smile touched Jamie's lips as they crossed that torn ground. Someone had dug a privy trench in the very spot where he had once knelt before the king to say his vows. I never dreamed how quick the sweet would turn to sour. I think we all agree that George is trying to get across that Jamie's life as a Kingsguard and as a knight has gone down the toilet. If we mix the info we got from his earlier chapter about how joining the Kingsguard actually lost him Cersei, with what he states here about not being allowed to joust and figuring out he was selected because of his father, Harrenhal is both the site of a dream come true for a teen boy and the start of a slippery slope into cynicism as his career is quickly robbed of hope and belief in the stories and legends. Put simply, there's no better place that Jamie could have come to make him reflect on the worth of his gone sword skill and what it's got him. In terms of tourney talk, let's not dismiss that we're only a few chapters removed from the tale of the Night of the Laughing Tree, so it's fascinating to so quickly see the same memory told from a very different angle. I was only 15, but no one could have beaten me that day. Ares never let me joust. Seems like a very very line, but we've got every reason to believe Jamie when he says he could have beaten anyone that day, especially if he's filled with confidence for his naming. And how much could that have changed if Jamie had succeeded and not let Rhaegar crown his queen of love and beauty? Note that Rhaegar had to beat four Kingsguard to earn his victory. Why not a fifth? 
Moving on from that side of things, here's another quote. Bolton's silence was a hundred times more threatening than Vargo Hope's slobbering malevolence. Pale as morning mist, his eyes concealed more than they told. Jamie misliked those eyes. After half a book off, although we certainly felt his presence in the early Aya chapter, Bruce Bolton returns to the narrative just before his major crime of the series, with Jamie aptly realising that the cruel violence of the Bloody Mummers pales in significance to what Bruce Bolton is capable of. But we also get another introduction just before the chapter ends, when the mysterious Kyburn enters the fold, and this seriously has a lot of consequences, as it's his work here with Jamie that will get him into Cersei's good graces in Feast. Not only does that mean the creation of Sir Robert Strong, it means unimaginable horror, torture and pain for several women of King's Landing, and who knows what else to come in the future. But sticking with the present, Jamie wraps up a chapter of ups and downs with a defiant up, demanding that he will go on, he will not lose any more of himself, and he'll take the pain that's coming his way. It's almost as if Jamie is going to battle one-on-one -on -one with his own injury. He's saying that the injury has taken as much as it's going to get, he's going to pay for it with his own screaming. He'll take whatever punch is thrown at him to earn this one small boon, this one tiny victory he can take from the whole thing, so at least he can look at his forearm and wrist in the future and know that he paid for that. And to finish, Jamie recommends that Kyburn tend to Brienne as well, telling us everything we want to hear. So there we are, we're nearly at the finish, we have one chapter remaining, let's get straight to it as we return to King's Landing for Tyrion 4. Given Tyrion's high chapter frequency in Clash of Kings, and how his King's Landing storyline will come to dominate the end of this book, it's a real surprise to see Jamie, Jon and Arya outmatch him for chapters so far. The King's Landing plot has finally started ramping up now in our earlier Sansa chapter, but the weird thing is that plot-wise, this Tyrion chapter might be one of his most forgettable in the entire A Song of Ice and Fire arc. Certainly there's nothing that burns itself into your memory, but that's only if we are looking strictly at the bare bones of the plot. George doesn't lay any duds, and there's still plenty of other gems to mine out here. For the most part, this is a chapter about a very disgruntled Tyrion trying to stave off referencing what he's disgruntled about in his forced wedding to Sansa, amongst other things. And it has a beginning a bit out of left field, as we're reminded, of all things, about Tyrion versus the small folk. We know that the idea of Tyrion being hated despite his saving of the city is going to become a major point in his trial, so it makes sense we get a reminder down at the docks. It's difficult to assess this fairly, because we know the true efforts that Tyrion went to for the city, how much of himself he put into the defence of the realm. At the same time, we know these people's lives were uprooted and their homes burned, so we can, we can understand them being angry, even if that anger is directed in the wrong place. And we spoke a lot in Clash of Kings about Tyrion never realising how he could have changed that, but it's likely too late now. There's a back and forth in the beginning as Tyrion switches between humility and wanting to help the small folk out, to getting incredibly angry with them and showing off more of his more violent tendencies. Don't forget, he was recently thinking about his hatred of the Vale and what he intended to unleash there. So first he starts with allowing some rebuilding, accepting his role in burning it out, he even follows it up with suggesting some increased safety measures for the children of King's Landing when Tyrion and Bronn pass through the trebuchets. But when one person dares to throw some manure his way, he very quickly snaps him into a different mood. On second thoughts, he said when they had the horse in hand, let the poxy brats splatter on the cobbles like overripe melons. This is a very violent reaction for Tyrion and goes to show that his composure is wearing down already. The manure is obviously being recognised as both an insult and a sign of disrespect, and it's fair that Tyrion believes this is unfair given what he did for the city. But he immediately throws all small folk, children included, in with this one person, and basically gets angry because one person dared to speak out against him. That wrapping himself in armour that he told Jon about so long ago doesn't look like such a good advice when he's responding to every negative notion like this. And yet later on in this chapter, he's throwing coppers for the kids again, so like I said, it's up and down. As much as there is to consider out there in the city, it's small potatoes compared to what Tyrion has to put up with the Red Keep. If he's finding negative vibes out in the small folk, they feel much closer inside the castle, where he has become convinced that everyone, even the horses, are laughing at him because he has not consummated the marriage of Sansa. And I think as he's got to my note on his thinking of Cersei versus Varys versus Sansa about how all this information got out. Either way, it's a real down of a situation for someone whose biggest hang-up is the constant mockery of others, and it's just going to grow and grow from here on out. Plus, complicated though it is, Tyrion feels frustration at being ridiculed for doing the right thing, quote-unquote, in terms of Sansa, and that's a very deep quote-unquote there. There's a quote. Tyrion would gladly have broken through her courtesy to give what solace he might, but it was no good. No words would ever make him fair in her eyes, or any less a Lannister. Now that we have his POV on the subject, we can see that Tyrion does truly want to make Sansa feel better. He cares about her feelings, 
but more importantly we can see he's gained some perspective and does recognize that at the end of the day it's his being a Lannister that is the root cause of this misery. As much as he'd like to, there's simply nothing he can do about that. Unfortunately, being human, recognizing these facts doesn't make it any easier on either one of them. Sansa is doomed to more misery, the two of them will forever go on feeling hated and rejected because that's how his personality has been formed, it's just his go-to, and knowledge of the cause doesn't change that. Unfortunately, even with this slightly clearer level of the thinking, Tyrion compounds himself with his creepy admittance of desiring Sansa despite her age. We can discuss this problem boiling down to George probably having needed to age up all the kids from the start, but whatever way you look at it, it's just plain creepy. Yes, true, Tyrion does highlight that he wants Sansa to want him, and isn't about to go ahead without consent, but I'm not sure that completely washes out the weirdness of him wanting her in the first place. Like we said earlier, Sansa is a child, Tyrion is not. He even lays out that that want is different from his desire for Winterfell, so he leaves no room for a defence of him being ambiguous. Even that need for Sansa to want him back can be traced to darker narratives, because as with nearly everything about Tyrion, it comes back to what happened with Tysha and Tywin. As we've seen and discussed in his scenes with Shay, Tyrion's base need is love both emotional and physical, because he's been so scarred in people being disgusted with his form. Shay provides that because she's being paid, Sansa does not because she doesn't desire him. So even with Tyrion's recognising she hates him because he's a Lannister, we can't single his surname out as the sole reason for his marriage being miserable. Now we turn our attention to Shay and, and Tyrion thinks on his telling her about Sansa. Some part of him had hoped for less indifference. Had hoped, he jeered bitterly. But now you know better, dwarf. Shay is all the love you're ever likely to have. This thinking also presents a clear problem. A major difference from the show we have to remember is that Book Shay is not bothered about the marriage to Sansa at all. Why? Because it doesn't affect her. So long as she keeps getting paid, so long as she keeps getting paid. There's not an emotional side to this for Bookshay, so she doesn't feel betrayed or neglected, and knows that she still provides a service Tyrion isn't getting anywhere else. But Tyrion is failing to recognise what he's already telling himself. He has just laid out that he can't change his appearance by wishing alone, he's just pointed out that Shay should probably be having a different reaction if she had an emotional bond to him, and yet he still categorises what she's offering as love, because he cannot bear the thought of it being anything else. When we look at it this way, it's really starting to look like a powder keg for Tyrion and his psyche. And what's the best thing to do with a powder keg? Start throwing matches at it. So we get with the return of Simon Silvertongue, whom I think best represents that Tyrion, at one point or another, is going to fall in some way. Unless you're Littlefinger or Varys, loose ends do come back to bite you at some point, and Simon is absolutely one of these. How many first-time readers would have remembered him from Clash of Kings, really? He's an incredibly small character that now comes back with leverage over Tyrion, threatening to tip his world upside down. Let's consider Simon doesn't even bother with Tyrion and just goes straight to Cersei or Tywin with the information. What happens then? At best, Tyrion has to watch Shay hang. At worst, he has to see her tortured mercilessly by Cersei or suffer constant manipulation to avoid such. Can we imagine the kind of inner rage and turmoil either option would raise in Tyrion or what that could mean for poor Sansa? It doesn't bear thinking about, but I think it just goes to show how tenuous Tyrion's position is. Even if he's not enjoying his current state all that much, things are going to get much worse at some point. I also believe that Tyrion's back and forth with Simon clearly demonstrates something else. Tyrion is just tired, he's disenfranchised, he's not on the top of his game. Not so long ago, back in Clash, Tyrion was politicking and verbally sparring with the best. He had his chapter of the three letters, he toyed with Varys and Littlefinger and Cersei and went from win to win. But now he's in some wine sink, instead plying his trade against a balding, chubby singer who might believe himself quite clever and silver-tongued, but really isn't. Simon is a poor substitute for any of those previously mentioned players when it comes to subtlety, threats, bartering, or the general playing of the game. I think Tyrion feels he's been demoted to a lesser league, and he can't summon the motivation to use his full skills now that he's no longer up against the champs, because he really plays down to the competition in this passage. This isn't the verbal dance and careful sparring we've come to know Tyrion for. This is a Tyrion who can't be bothered to play, so he just says whatever he needs to, and then orders Bronn to tip the board as soon as he's finished. Simon is a large part of why this chapter sticks out as an oddity, because obviously after this order, he doesn't return. Tyrion rarely thinks of him, and he basically doesn't seem essential, other for this display of Tyrion just reaching the end of his rope and resorting to endgame orders straight away. What does live on, however, is the song. One of my favourite parts of this reread project is seeing where certain characters originate their repeated internal mantras, such as Danny's If I look back, I am lost, etc. For hands of gold are always cold, but a woman's hands are warm, is going to play in Tyrion's mind once we reach the darkness of A Dance with Dragons, so perhaps Simon will enjoy the fact his work lived on after he did. Tyrion doesn't remember the singer, really he doesn't even remember the song, 
because this truly doesn't become important to him until his later murder of Shay, eerily foretold in these lyrics. Because this terrible act clearly stamps its place onto Tyrion's mind and soul. It's super fitting, given that he associated so much of his previous relationship with Tysha with a song that he will soon do the same with another lover and another relationship that ended horrifically. Not content with feeling miserable about the small folk, Sansa and Shay, Tyrion tops off the chapter by having to interact with the source of all his misery, his father. And in today's little meet and greet, Tywin has a pair of swords he wants to show off. Let's cast our mind back to the end of Clash of Kings, when a victorious Tywin rode his horse into the throne room, clad head to foot in his golden lion armour. That used to be our best example of Tywin being completely hypocritical about caring what other people thought, or the opinions of the sheep. But now we have a new contender as best instance of Tywin really, really caring about opinions. Here's a quote. Cherrywood for the scabbards, bound in red leather and ornamented with a row of lion's head studs in pure gold. Perhaps with garnets for the eyes. Rubies, Lord Tywin said. Garnets lack the fire. Evidently, these swords have to scream Lannister, and there's several reasons for this. First is the later learned fact that these swords were once ice, Ned's great sword, so it's almost as if Tywin is trying to beat the starkness out of it, and present them as though they have both only ever been Lannister blades. The second is that one of Tywin's only failures, in his mind anyway, is the acquisition of a Valerian steel sword. In the same way that Jaime has never met anything he doesn't think he can kill, Tywin has never met anything he doesn't think he can buy or control. So the fact that his wealth has never solved this problem is not only frustrating, but adds to his jealousy of being the only kid on the playground without a shiny toy. Much like Tyrion, Tywin's psychology is grounded in that they are all against me mentality that formed when he saw so many Westermen laughing at his father. The whole thing symbolises something Tywin can't control, which he hates. Hence, whether he admits it to himself or not, Tywin has likely always believed other families feel themselves better than the Lannisters because they have a Valyrian steel sword likely making him all the more smugly he now has two. I'm not sure it's ever made clear if people question how the Lannisters magically acquired not one but two Valerian steel swords. Oh, and by the way, what happened to that massive great thing you chopped Ned Stark's head off with? But clearly, Tywin goes 110% with the Lannister decorations to try and discourage such questions. The two colours lapped over one another without ever touching, each ripple distinct like waves of night and blood upon some steely shore. So that's a, a rather beautiful description of the sword here. And speaking of Ned's death, I really want to believe these red ripples are so deeply set in the swords because they represent the blood of Ned Stark and the great crime of House Lannister that cannot be cleared from their souls. Certainly, that will make it even more enjoyable if Oathkeeper does end up defending Sansa or at least fighting for House Stark. With this fool's dabber of Stannis and his magic sword, it seemed to me we had best give Joffrey something extraordinary as well. A king should bear a kingly weapon. And again, if you were to ask Tywin if he is bothered that people say Stannis has a magic sword but Joffrey doesn't, or that Stannis looks a warrior while Joffrey doesn't, he would tell you no, he does not care what other people think. But clearly this fool's jabber plays on his mind in some way or another because he's doing something about it. Here's another quote. The old kings of the rock had owned such a weapon, but the great sword Brightroar had been lost when the second king Tommen carried it back to Valeria on his fool's quest. He had never returned, nor had Uncle Jerry, the youngest, most reckless of his father's brothers, who had gone seeking after the lost sword some eight years past. Speaking of family history, the reason Tywin doesn't already have his own Valerian steel sword is because his ancestor, Tom II, lost it on a fool's quest. The other Lannister associated with the sword is Jerrion, Tywin's least favourite brother. Jerrion is renowned for being a joker, a laugher, the closest Lannister to Tyrion in some respects. So we have Tom II, a fool, and Jerrion the laugher tied into this sword. We know how Tywin hates laughter and looking foolish thanks to his father, so the loss of their family sword is all tied into what he hates and fears most about his own family, hence his desperation to start anew with a different sword. It is meant for my son, it says Tywin to Tyrion. So we get a major hint on what Tywin is intending for Jamie once he returns to King's Landing. I suppose it's also a cue that Tywin must be all in on the Red Wedding now, seeing as he's just melted down a valuable bargaining chip if he ever needed to come to the table with Rob Stark. But the more interesting is that we know this is going to be his bribe to get Jaime out of the Kingsguard and back to being an heir. We've discussed this desperate need of Tywin's in Tyrion's previous chapter of this book, but now we're being told how he intends to do it. To be fair, he's not entirely wrong. Jaime loves nothing more than a sword, and this is a hell of a sword. If Jaime had returned whole, there's a good chance this ploy would have worked, although that would be discounting the myriad of emotional issues that goes into Jaime's refusal. Regardless, there is an ultimate irony of a sword being especially created for Jaime and then presented to us a mere chapter after learning all about how Jaime's loss of the ability to wield it is affecting him. 
I think part of this need for Jamie to become an heir is Tywin starting to become real desperate about the future of House Lannister. Jerrion disappeared without a son. Tyjit is missing, presumed dead. Kevin has one son dead, one son near death and another captured, although he will be returned soon enough. As for Tywin himself, he has one in the Kingsguard and he has Tyrion, and we know what he thinks of that situation. Therefore, he has to get Jamie out and producing legitimate children of House Lannister to continue on. In its proper form, I don't think Tywin would be happy with the hordes of cousins taking over. Thus, he throws a great big stink when Jamie does reject the notion later on, though not as large as the one he would have thrown if he'd lived long enough for Jamie to just give this sword away. In fact, granted these swords are, and as happy as Tywin is to have them, neither are going to bring the result he wants. Oathkeeper is given away, and Widow's Whale makes a brief enough appearance to battle against a book, before presumably being put away until Tommen is old enough to have it, and I think we can all agree that isn't going to happen. More likely it ends up in the hands of fake Hagon, perhaps? Although sim symbolically, it would be pretty cool if Daenerys got her hands on it, being a widow and all. The conversation next turns to the accounts of the crown, which you think would be less interesting than two Valerian steel swords, but it's actually very telling. Specifically, it tells a lot about how much of a complete idiot Tywin is, while at the same time making Littlefinger look very smart. Why? I have seen Littlefinger's accounts. Crown incomes are ten times higher than they were under Ares. So I, I can't read this line and not laugh. It is so utterly, utterly Tywin, and tells the story of a man who, since birth, has had more wealth than actually imaginable. So much so, Tywin has never had to stop and think about the other side of the column to income. He doesn't seem to compute basic e economic theory, the idea of profit of loss or of balance. Why bother? As the Lannister, that really doesn't come into it. We see this in a moment when Tywin simply tells Tyrion to find the money, or someone else will, because that's what it is to Tywin. Money is just there, it's to be accessed when needed. As we discussed in Tyrion's last chapter, people like Kevin and Tywin simply don't view Littlefinger as a worthy adversary or someone to worry about because he isn't a house. So to them, he is not so much a piece on the board as a part of the board itself, something you spin or push and money comes out. Community chest isn't allowed to have motives, it's just part of the game. So clearly, Tywin doesn't consider the fact that Clever Littlefinger has been cooking the books for years and they might actually be in a spot of bother here. Here's a quote. Extravagance has its uses. We must demonstrate the power and wealth of Cassidy Rock for all the realm to see. So that's another point in the Tywin does actually care what people think column. Tywin never wants to be seen as having to save because that is where his power and control comes from. So he'd rather beggar the realm, but not his own house of course. In A Feast of Crows, Kevin Lannister tells Cersei that the kingdom is in ruin, and we can see some very strong signs of that here. Not only is there the lack of money and the fact that the crown are in debt to several different parties, but Tyrion gives us this update on the state of affairs at the docks. Before we can open the port again, the Blackwater is going to have to be dredged, the sunken ships broken up or raised, three quarters of the quays need repair, and some may have to be torn down and rebuilt. The entire fish market is gone with both the river gate and the king's gate are splintered from the battering Stannis gave them and should be replaced. I shudder to think of the cost. That's an incredible amount of damage that is going to take a lot of money and time to repair. The knock-on effects of this are staggering. The kingdom is missing its central port, affecting the economy and availability of supplies throughout almost all of the south. This is a really, really bad situation that Tywin is confident he can just throw money at to go away, to go away. The state of the docks and harbour I cannot overstate are really important to life in general in Westeros. Although I would be amused if they were to all be rebuilt, just as one or two Targaryen armies show up to smash everything down again. The chapter closes on two very different issues. The first is a return to the chapter's beginnings and Tyrion's issues with Sansa. The second is a rather surprising addition of the plights of the Night's Watch, which, as with, everything, as with much else in this chapter, shows us how Tywin is equal parts selfish and equal parts idiotic. First comes the issue of Sansa, and Tywin seemingly being genuinely confused about why his son is not raping a child. Clearly, the idea of consent, or even basic human decency, does not come into the equation, because to Tywin, this is a matter of state. Of course, Tywin frames this all in a way that makes it seem Tyrion is a failure for not committing rape, that he is the odd one out in some way and isn't normal, as Tywin so often likes to do. Ultimately, we find that Tywin is discussing this because he dearly wants the North, and seeing how fixed in place the Red Wedding is, it's now clear he intends to double-cross Roose Bolton and, and take the North back from him via Sansa, but also because he's already messed up with the other side of the plan. Cersei. We can't blame Tyrion for feeling pretty happy about this news. It's a rare double whammy victory. Not only is Cersei unwanted, but Tywin has just had a repeat of, of the rebuff from Tyrion's childhood he made such a huge stink about in Tyrion's previous chapter. Again, Tywin does not like not feeling in control, and suddenly his new allies are finding it within them to refuse him straight up. 
And given the fact that Willis is a cripple, is only going to bother Tywin even more, given his thoughts on Tyrion. The solution? Tell no one. Act like it never happened. Again, save face above all. Especially with Cersei. And while this could be read as Tywin not wanting to upset his daughter, I find that incredibly unlikely. Finally, to end, comes the discussion of the Night's Watch and their bad news. And to be honest, it's, it's a pretty straight repeat from Tyrion 3 when Varys brought them up before. As we said a couple of weeks ago for that chapter, Tywin is showing how absurdly awful he is as a hand. The news from the wall is much worse than before. The Lord Commander has been killed and there looks to be an immediate assault on the wall and there by the north. But Tywin doesn't give a toss. Indeed, his only concern is if he can glean any advantage whatsoever for House Lannister out of the deal. So corrupting an 8,000 year old institution, putting an incapable leader in place, endangering thousands of people and the stability of a realm already in dire straits as we mentioned a minute ago, that's all fine as long as it benefits Tywin and his family. It is absolutely absurd how awful Tywin is, and this passage goes to show just as much as the one Tyrion III. Traditionally, people will lay all of Tywin's many evils at his feet, but claim at least he was an effective hand. I argue no, he really was not. And even though Stannis saves his ass on this particular issue, we can see from what's happening exactly what selfish Tywin brought the world. Good riddance. And that is the end of Tyrion IV. That is today's episode all five chapters for you so like i say some very difficult passages today it's a very important passages today even if uh, the plot is slightly different to the, the big bangers that we've had recently with Daenerys and such luckily big moments are coming again next week in our next five chapters come back next week to listen to those we'll have another pair pick remember this week is tywin versus rob who would you rather have as a pov do let us know do get in contact going to sign off pretty quickly here because this has been a long podcast and it's still raining outside and i have to walk the dog so thank you all for tuning in hope to see you next time and have a good week